Hi, and welcome to today's episode of The Focus. I'm Aldu. And I'm Horia. And today we have the pleasure of interviewing Angus Muir. Um, we've come across Angus through a mutual acquaintance that explained to us how wonderful the work is that Angus is doing in the world of work with inspiring people to embrace the practice of using value streams. So Angus, welcome. Tell us a little bit about your river of life. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. And, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I, you know, my, my career in Agile has been an interesting one. My, my very first job out of university was uh, with a, a manufacturing company, a, a defense contractor. And they were into Lean Six Sigma, these kinds of things. And I was like, this is really interesting. I, I wonder how this applies to software development. And of course, you know, without dating myself too much, this is before things like Scrum had hit the, uh, the airwaves yet. Uh, so I had spent years looking at lean manufacturing. And then when Scrum came on, I looked at it and said, wow, these things, you know, I, I swear they're written from the same textbook. You know, yeah, they use different words, but they were delivering the exact same message. And so I've been spending my entire career since then going through different organizations, trying to help them make that transition to, to Agile. And, and, you know, someone will say, well, didn't you get them there? Why are you saying trying to? And I said, well, because we never get there. We, we get uh, it introduced. We get a lot of change happening. We get a lot of good things happening. But if you said we're done, you just stop being a good lean agile shop that day. There is no done. And, and so we always are looking for, okay, as, as good as we are today, um, you know, what can we do to be better tomorrow? And, and so that's been, you know, geez, I started this journey in 1992. So that's what I've been doing. And, and it's been so exciting and invigorating uh, to see how you, know, you introduce these ideas and people look like you're, like you're crazy. And then you finally get them, come on, just try and see. And, and they go, okay, fine. They try it and they go, wow, this is different. Uh, and, and so it's a lot of fun. Uh, so yes, that's what I've been doing. I continue to do it today. I, I work for a large insurance company. So anybody who says Agile doesn't work on a mainframe, please don't tell my mainframe group that they, they don't know it doesn't work. So leave them alone. Anybody who says it doesn't work in a heavily regulated industry, Again, insurance is heavily regulated. It works beautifully. Uh, and, I, and I love busting down those kinds of myths. Uh, in, in addition, I do a lot of um, uh, consulting work outside of my company. And so I work with uh, organizations and, and I'm working with a government organization right now to help them make the shift to Agile. Boy, that is one heck of a challenge. Uh, the, the desire to not change is part of their DNA. It's, it's almost built into how they operate. Uh, so uh, uh, those are the kind of challenges I love. And uh, certainly um, spent the last few years, you mentioned value streams. Uh, we started looking at value streams probably about six, seven years ago. And uh, uh, it took a lot of discussion and uh, description and diagrams and, and more discussion to even get people to understand what we were talking about. Mm. But once they got there, they said, let's, let's do it. And they started making those shifts. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I know one of the things I was thinking about when I said, what do I want to talk to you guys about is, you know, I'll often get asked, you know, what do you think about it? Is that a good idea? And, and I'll never forget, someone showed me a value stream presentation. I said, that is beautiful. That is uh, some of the best collateral I've ever seen on describing what a value stream is. And they, they were feeling you know, pretty good about that. And, and I said, you've never done this before, have you? And they're like, uh, no. And I said, it shows in your collateral. Uh, you've got this model that is beautiful as long as I can dedicate the entire organization to that one product line. As soon as I take anything and say, okay, some of it's going to go to this value stream and some of it's going to go to that value stream, the model starts to break down in our herd. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a great idea and, and we need to keep exploring it and building on it. Uh, we need to understand um, how do you put the right um, controls around it? How do you put the right oversight on it to make sure it's going to operate effectively? when it's working in an, a real in, uh, organization, that is not going to be that single focus, you know, I only do this. Uh, uh, you know, 
I, I work in an insurance company, so we have our personal lives insurance. We have our, our uh, business insurance. We have our bond or our security. Those are all different products. I can't turn around and say, and here's your six IT shop. No, it's one. Mm. And so suddenly we become a shared resource across those value streams. So this is a very interesting uh, uh, problem to solve. Yeah, uh, but I'm excited about this and, and a lot to look forward to in the next, who knows how many years I'm going to keep doing this. Very good. Thank you for that uh, introduction, yeah. Angus. Um, I have a follow-up question. Um, we've been uh, interviewing quite a lot of people and one of the guys uh, that we interviewed was Al Shalloway a few, a few episodes back. Yeah. And um, one of the things you said, the value stream model breaks down. Um, it's because uh, um, this is a, a suggestion as a potential reason. Uh, it's because it's not really, it, it, it's an island on its own. It's not viewed in, in terms of a larger value network um, and, and, and looking at those dependencies. How would you say, uh, how common how how common would you say is, is that type of uh, experience? Yeah, I, I think um, you know Al's comments are, are actually right on the money. Um, it, as soon as I, I take something like and I'll, I'll use an example in the insurance company, we'd say okay, um, you're, we're going to be our, our our personal line value stream, and we're going to take care of all of our personal lines um, uh, products. Well, that means. I need, mean, you know, the sales and marketing of legal, uh, all that kind of stuff as part of the value stream. But when I get to my technology group, it means I need my policy center system, I need my billing system, I need my claim system. Well, we can't have a claim system for every line of business. It's one for all of them. And so suddenly people will say, well, let's make that that claim system and that billing system its own value stream. And and I just created an island. And that island is now suddenly in conflict uh, because <laughs> the personal line wants on the island and the business line wants on the island and the specialty insurance wants on the island. And, and, and so he's right on the money about that's what creates the, the conflict. And, and the challenge is once you have that conflict, um, short of saying, I'm going to find a way to carve up that island and give everybody their piece, which creates technical challenges now you can imagine a, a big system like a claim system being independently operated on and modified by three independent groups wow the, the, the integrity of that system is going to fall apart in a hurry uh, so you know it, it i got i've got pain if i do it this way i got pain if i do it that way and so every organization starts creating all these administrative processes to get around that and and all of the these oversight functions to make sure you know we'll have an architectural review board wow nothing says lean like an architectural review board <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know you, you get all these challenges that come out of it he's right the question is what do you do about it uh there's no easy answer if i turned around and said i am a personal line only company suddenly i've got my answer find an insurance company that only deals with one line of business is is well is, that's going to be a very short-lived insurance company they're going to be knocked out of business or, or bought up or something so yeah uh, so but he, he's right on the money with with the challenge there. and and yeah al is very very familiar with value streams he has spent a lot of time studying that and, and certainly understands it exceptionally well yeah, we've been quite privileged to help him yeah. build the value stream consultant uh, course for PMI when he was working there. So we were yeah. we, we helped him with that uh, in 2020. That was a really interesting journey. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Well, certainly, certainly, you guys went to, to one of the best in the industry to uh, uh, help you understand the problem. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Talking of that problem, Horio. Yeah. Um... It's fascinating how we have a tendency to structure ourselves functionally. Um, yeah. It's it's quite convenient to say, uh, we are the marketing people, we are the sales people, we are the operations people, we are the product development people. And therefore we end up with fiefdoms uh, divided by 
functional characteristics. And there's much to say about affinity, right? Um, if you have people that, that have uh, strong affinity bonds, then why not regard them um, in a united fashion? The challenge, however, is that we then forget our purpose because our shared purpose is not to have our fiefdom. Our shared purpose is to contribute value flow to a particular end user, a stakeholder. Because without that customer, what purpose do we have as an organization in the first place? None. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's such a great um, comment and such a great observation. And I've, I've struggled with that thought for a long time. You know, why do we organize in, you know, we'll call it our functional silos, uh, you know, and, and there is a certain amount of affinity of, hey, the three of us, we're, we're all, uh, you know, uh, lean agilists. And so we're going to group together so that we can bounce off each other and, and expand our thinking off each other. But that's not our reason for existing. Our, our reason for existing is to be out in the value stream, helping them improve the value. Well, the only way I'm going to do that is if I take the time to learn about well, why is finance having a problem here? Why is marketing having a problem here? I have to learn enough about their world to understand how what I'm doing is either supporting them or making their life more difficult. That's hard work. And, and I, I don't want to say that, you know, people are afraid of hard work, but they, they kind of go, well, I'm a developer. Why do I need to understand how to, you know, how difficult it is to balance the month end. Uh, well, because the code changes you made threw us out of balance three months in a row. And we just sent our finance group into a tizzy for four days at the end of every month trying to close the books before uh, we get into trouble. That's why. Uh, and so people don't naturally think that way. And, and, you know, I'm kind of making a number up here, but my casual observation is about 5% of the population is out there is what I'd call natural flow thinkers. You show them a flow system and they go, oh, yeah, of course, right? Uh, and if you show them a, a system that's locally optimized, they'll go, that's not going to work. Most of us look at lo local optimization as the goal. I need to make my group as efficient as possible. Yeah, but you're dragging down the system. Yeah, that's someone else's problem because my group is efficient. Uh, and, and that's the way most people think. And, and all, I got, all I can really conclude is we're trained to think that way through school. We're trained to think that way through our first job. We're trained to think that way through every experience we've had in life. And uh, most of us just fall into that pattern. And then we have to very consciously break it. We have to very consciously learn about things like uh, uh, throughput and flow and constraint systems. We have to actually study that and, and observe it and see it in action before we believe it and internalize it. Uh, so it's been a fascinating journey and, and I'm still struggling at times with how do I break that silo down? How do I yeah. deal with a person who says, no, 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 what's happening over there isn't my problem. Um, I, I have a fun little question I ask uh, um, people when I'm, when I'm doing some coaching and, and I use it as kind of that flow test. And I'll say, you know, I have a team that's producing 50 units of work uh, a month. And I found through some freak accident that if I send two of them home half time, but I pay them full time, the team starts to produce 80 units of work. Should I send them home? And the, the, the best, the funniest answer I got is, I know you want me to say yes, I just don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> and, but there's a small group of people who go of course send them home get them out of there get the productivity up then we'll figure out why later but most people's response no mm -hmm. uh, get them doing something else get them and, and i said wow you took your eye off the ball um and and now because you got them doing something else 50 units of work just dropped to 30 units of work mm. now what do you do and so it's it's a very interesting little test they run on people. But it shows me quickly how they're thinking. So one of the things that um, uh, you you know this the, the, the is at play here is is biases is in group versus out group bias and, and we're hardwired to think that way. Many of us are actually hardwired to think in terms of the in group versus out group bias. Um, so. 
that that that's potentially one of the things that can explain this phenomenon. I, I you know, that's a really uh, I, I like the connection you made there because uh, you're reminding me of a conversation I had with the PMI probably about uh, two three months ago. I, I said, you know, I'm an agilist and everything about my environment and everything about how I work and everything about the people I engage with presses the idea that project managers are the enemy. They're the out group, right? We're the in group, we're all the agilists and, and we're doing the great stuff and you're the out group that's trying to drag us down. And, uh, you know, I, I spent some time a few years ago saying, wait a minute, project managers have a very special skill set that, that agilists don't have. But need, and and so guys, how are we going to uh, shift the behaviors of how they like to, to apply that skill set to a way that's going to be constructive to the system? And it was very interesting to watch watch the reaction. The first reaction is you can, mm. of course you can. You know, <laughs> they're, they're 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 living competent people with good skills. What we have to do is work with them uh, jointly to show them great ways and discover great ways to apply those skills to improve the flow of work. Uh, but that in and out bias really, really uh, um, is strong. And so one of the things I always warn people about as, as agilists is, you know, don't become the agile snob mm -hmm. that, that says, if you're not thinking this way, you're not adding value. <laughs> you <know? laughs> like, yeah. I like that, the agile snob. Okay, I like that. I, I have stronger words sometimes, but I'll, I'll, I won't, 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 won't I, say it yet. I, I, I'm mindful of the recordings. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, status is something that um, has a profound influence. And status is more about appearance than um, necessarily anything else. So therefore, we will fight for how things appear as opposed to how things actually are. That's why we have um, spin doctors. That's why um, in politics, there's so much pressure on making things appear a certain way. Mm. Right? Now, from a perspective of Looking into the future of organizations and humanity in general, we cannot afford to just look at appearances. We need to consider truthfulness. We need to consider what is actually factual, right? Because um, there are some limitations of the human body. We still need to eat, right? We still need some shelter. Uh, I cannot pretend that I have a roof over my head. It actually has to be a roof over the head. Otherwise, my life expectancy kind of dramatically drops. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. <clears throat> so yeah. a challenge here is how do we engage in conversations with one another in a manner that <clears throat> the Maori in New Zealand have an interesting concept. It's called mana. <clears throat> so mana is a... Is a fascinating concept that embraces a number of elements of mutual respect, um, tradition, um, lineage, uh, pride in one's territory and uh, family roots and achievements and past um, martial or economic glory, if you will, all of that is reflected in, in this aspect of mana. Um, you could um, equate it to, uh, to a certain extent with the idea of gravitas uh, mm -hmm. fr from from Latin. Yeah, it has this this <clears throat> intention. However, mana is also the idea of we see eye to eye. In other words, I'm not looking up at you, and you're not looking down at me, or vice versa. I'm not kind of looking mm -hmm. down my nose at you. We're actually sharing the same breath. We're we're meeting as fellow creatures that engage and nurture each other's mutual mana, right? Um, there's this idea of manakitanga. Manakitanga um, would be roughly translated as the, the husbandry or the, the nurturing of, of, of mana, the um, guardianship, the preservation of, of mana. And that's something that 
Unfortunately, sometimes we say this is what we want to achieve, but when it comes to actually practicing it, we're struggling. We fall yeah. into, oh, uh, he didn't do what I told him to. Off with his head. Mm -hmm. um, let him out <laughs> of this organization. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, good. It's not just my shop then. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you were hitting on, um, to me, one of the, the most critical uh, of the lean principles. And, and when, I, when I look at the lean principles, and, and, and we'll talk about delivering value and building in quality and, and you know, uh, stabilization and, and uh, standardization, these kinds of things. I, I say these are all important, and you you must address all of them. But the most important thing that underpins it all is respect for people. Mm. It is also the hardest one to do well. Uh, and and you know, I I was just leading someone through a conversation uh, uh, last week where I said, let me talk to you about the email you sent out. And this is one of our most collaborative, open leaders ever. And 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 I said, yeah, you did a lot of things to try and help the team and that that is nice but what you did is you said here's my problem great statement then you said here's what you need to do about it and you started solving it for them and i said with that one helpful little bit you start telling them how to do their job and no offense they're better at their job than you are uh, and then you said and make sure you look here here and here and i said, you just bounded the scope of, of where they're going to look and that leads to a um, a pattern I call learned helplessness. Mm. And, and that is just so incredibly powerful. You can take someone who is incredibly competent at their role and by chipping away at them, by, by you know, like I said, looking down your nose at them uh, and by, by, you know, hey, they didn't do what I expected, you know, get on them. You can actually chip away at their confidence where they're going to reach the point of saying, well, I used to think we should do this, but I better go ask. Mm. And as soon as you put them into that mode, a fully competent person no longer is capable of even making simple choices and acting on them. They become paralyzed. And you can paralyze entire teams, and it's amazing how fast you can happen. Uh, and it, it's in the subtlest of ways. Um, you know, you might make, uh, you know, some, you know, some crack wise about my hair or something and and you know sure it's funny but if you do that often enough i might go well wait a minute is there a problem here is there something i need to do is, and i'll start to doubt uh and i i think that's one of those things i i'll, I'll take a, a cheap shot at the it people because i am one um we have the emotional intelligence of a ficus and so we don't understand that when we're being you know quote direct we can actually be pretty offensive. And, and the effect that can have is devastating to people. Mm. Uh, it is very hard to get a lot of people to understand that. Again, easy when you're dealing with you know, a small organization. What happens when you scale it up? So right now in our shop, we're, we're, you know, we're not a huge shop, but we're running about 36 to 38 Agile teams right now, working on a unified outcome. So they, they are... 38 teams that must stay coordinated to produce. Uh, and so you best believe that any crack in the respect ripples through that organization quickly and yeah. we see productivity fall. Uh, uh, so yeah, it's such an important point. I, if you've got an answer on how to solve that and, and, and make it stay solved, I, I'm, I'm all ears, man. <laughs> It's really a single answer. It's usually a combination of uh, a bunch of factors. Yeah. Um, and one of the critical things is leadership um, and, and that awareness of the, the impact of their behavior. Um, and a lot of the research in, in adaptive oversight, um, there's quite a, a lot of key leadership uh, behaviors that can inhibit or support this balance. Yeah. And and I have uh, you just reminded me of something that we 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 run some leadership training. Um, you know, you've heard of the frozen middle, and we're working very hard in our organization to start thawing it out. Uh, and and one of the things I'll do when I'm I'm uh, talking to people about the principles is I I created a slide that that said, hey, look, there's there's these kind of six six uh, you know patterns or anti patterns of of a good lean agile leader. And, and for example, I might say. 
um, as an ad a leader, I make decisions based on the risk of, of what the team's proposing, not whether what I like what they're proposing. I may hate what they're proposing, but if it's an acceptable level of risk and they believe it's going to work, then who am I to tell them they're wrong? That is a very uh, uh, difficult concept for a lot of managers to get because they're like, no, 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 I, I know, I'll tell them, no, you won't. Right? And, and, and so what I do is I go through these, these patterns with them and, I, and I'll say to the, the group, I'll say, hey, everybody put up your hand if you think you lead this way. And of course, ah, ah. <laughs> and they go, great, great, great. If I go ask your team, I want you to leave your hand up if you think they'll agree with you. And you can see all the leaders go, oh, oh, I'm, I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> and it's like, there you go. There's the challenge. If you can get everybody in your team saying, yeah, my leader models these six patterns, you're going to have a much better team, a much better life. But I'm betting they're not going to say that. And, 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 you know, then I'll throw in my kind of my 10 second sound bite. Like, you know, by the way, if you ever found yourself saying something like, well, that's not the way I do it. You're probably not a good agile leader. <laughs> you know? mm. And I have a few CIOs, so I do tend to say that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, just coming back to leadership training, uh, we had another guest uh, uh, a few episodes back that said that traditional leadership training doesn't work. And I just had an idea. It's instead of calling it leadership training, why don't we call it leadership practice uh, in an organization? Because that means you've got to stay on top of building new skills, building new capabilities all the time instead of it, oh, I'm now a leader because the certificate I have just earned said I'm a leader. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of lost for words, which is, is rare. Um, <laughs> I, it was very interesting. I just had a, a conversation over the weekend with the, um, you know, the president of a, of a, a large motors company. Because I said, look, I got this problem with these leaders and that constant evolution. And I said, you are a Lean Six Sigma organization. You must have cracked that nut. Like, there's no way you can run a, a, a company like that in a lean fashion and not have your leaders. And, and he goes, oh, yeah, in the manufacturing side, he took me through all that. And I said, well, tell me about your IT side. And he goes, no, nothing at all. And he goes, they, they, not at all. Hey, you know, we're, we're, we're still at war with them. And, and so I, I, I suddenly realized, well, wait a minute, there is a difference between a leader in the manufacturing side and the leader uh, on the IT side. When you are leading as a knowledge worker or lead, leading knowledge workers, the first thing you have to get over is the fact that they know more about the job than you do. And you better accept that. And if you can't accept that, you need to step out of leadership. Uh, the, the challenge is getting people to realize that that takes an awful lot of self-awareness and most people aren't that self-aware and they won't do that much introspection to even figure it out. Uh, so we have to find other ways to lead them to those same conclusions. Now, as a, an agile coach, uh, you can, you can kind of get them there and show them, but what's going to happen is you're going to move the ball and then you're going to step away and the ball is going to stay right there. It's never going to move again. So you can go back and you move it a bit further and they go, oh yeah, that's good. And then it stays right there. And if you don't come back and touch base when that ball is going to start rolling back. Because they're going to be under stress, something's going to happen and they're going to revert to old behaviors. So the challenge is how do I get it into their DNA that whatever I am today, as good as it is, tomorrow I need to figure out how to be better. And that's just let me ask you the simple question. What's the incentive to perpetually get better? Um, you know, very few companies reward for that. Yeah. Uh, very few companies acknowledge that you're doing it. And so it, it, it purely comes from an in, inside self-motivation to say, I want us to be better because we can be better. Well, we're back into a very small segment of the population. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you convince the person who's got uh, 30 years in and going more years and I'm on full full pension. How do you convince them to spend the next six years getting better? Mm. Uh, you know, and, and it's, it's a tough one. Or, or, or you know, the, the, the 
new person who comes in and already steals it. <laughs> you know? I have some uh, ideas on that one. Great. I get the feeling. I get the feeling that it has to do with play. Um, humans love the concept of play, and unfortunately, too often in the world of work, we forget that creativity and ingenuity and innovation requires a little bit of painting outside the lines. There has to be a little play, a little jiggle in what it is that we're doing to do different, to do better. Better doesn't mean the same, the same, the same. Better means break a little bit of what you're doing right now such that you can become better, right? You yeah. think of um, um, golfers, right? And they have to break their swing in order to yeah. remake it into an even better one. But, but as a leader, what you just said is a very risky proposition. It is. Uh, you know, I have a team that's functioning quite well. Mm -hmm. And you're telling me to break them? Well, people lose their jobs over stuff like that. So why would I do it? What's the incentive? Uh, other than some loose promise that on the other side will be better. Uh, that's, that's an awfully big thing for, for people to swallow. Well, see, therein lies the challenge because being effective and thriving in business in the long run is not mandatory. If you're yeah. tempted to say, no, 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 we got the recipe just right. Um, the taste is perfect. We're not going to change anything of the ingredients. We're going to keep it like that forever, right? Fine, it may work. Until such time that some weird and wacky competitor six months from now comes up with a completely new taste experience and they, everybody goes, whoa, this is so much better. And boom, you're out of business. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's right. And, and certainly industries have experienced that. You know, all those disruptors that came along and, and turned their world upside down. Um, and, and other industries still believe they're immune to that. Um, you know, I, I would say certainly in Canada, if you were to try to convince the banking or, or insurance sector that they are vulnerable to a disruptor, they're going, nah, government regulation will ensure that never happens. Ooh, well, yeah. That, yeah, until it does. So it's a bit of a, um, you know, I say it's a, a naive point of view, but I also say, well, wait a minute. Uh, these people who are saying that have spent 30, 40 years of their career and the sector has not materially changed in that time. So mm -hmm. Why should they anticipate it's going to change in the next 10? Uh, so yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting conundrum and, and um, it, it really is about having to go out with each organization, even inside my own company, when I'm looking at a team or a value stream or a business partner, I've got to really take the time to say, well, what's going to motivate that person what's going to excite them to say yeah i'll try this and mm -hmm. um you want to talk about bespoke solutions i have to find a different motivation sometimes even within the same value stream uh we, we use a model called two in the box where we have at, at the head of the value stream will be your business leader and your technology leader working together as partners i often have to use one motivation here and a completely different motivation there mm -hmm. to get them both agree to a change. It, it's it's a, um, you know one of the unwritten rules they say about agile is let's say because uh, no one will ever tell you this um, because you'll probably never start if you knew it. Uh, I say the transition to agile is about fifteen percent tips, tricks, tools, processes, procedures, whatever you want to call it. It's eighty-five percent the psychology of the people you're dealing mm. with. You ignore the eighty-five percent at your own peril. The problem is we all focus on the 15% because it's easy. <laughs> I, had a, I had a client that, uh, that that got some of these up and down disks uh, yeah. and they called them agile disks. And they say, we're an agile organization. <laughs> like, whoa, what are you smoking, dude? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. I, I didn't realize it was that easy. <laughs> I can't believe I didn't think that 20 years ago. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. I want to drill, drill in a little bit uh, deeper into your experience and your recent experience with moving into embedding value streams into the, the organization. Um, what's your view about moving to a value stream approach? So, so overall, I, I think it's something you absolutely have to explore as an organization. Even if you choose not to go there, 
make that choice with your eyes wide open about the value it brings. Because mm. one of the biggest things I see happening in, in uh, the value streams you've implemented is that barrier between IT and business really starts to break down in a hurry. Mm. And suddenly that tight, tight relationship starts to form. And uh, uh, it gets to that point where I'm going, you know, Horia, okay, you're my business partner. This is what you need. Let me see what I can do to, to enable that and make that happen. And I'm going to take you on that journey with me. And every key decision I'm making, you and I are making it together. And if you don't understand why I'm making the decision, I'm going to take the time to sit down and explain it to you. Just like when you have to make some business decision, I'm going, why are you doing that? Mm. Uh, you explain it to me and I'm like, oh, I get it. Uh, I, because, <laughs> again, I'll, I'll poke at IT a bit. IT over the time has developed this incredible arrogance of we have to protect the business from themselves because they don't know what they're doing. And, and I'm sitting there going, really? So this, this VP over here became a VP because he's an idiot? I, I don't think that's true, but that's essentially what people will say. Well, no, he got there because we did this stuff for him. No, no, he didn't. He got there because he's an incredibly competent businessman. And, and now our job is to enable him and, and trust him to run the business. Um, as long as you're two separate organizations, you are never going to build that trust. But as soon as I put the two of you together and force you to work together, you're either going to build that trust and create an incredibly um, high-performing organization, or you're going to explode and one of you is going to be replaced. Uh, and guess what, IT? It's probably you. It's the business people run the show. They're the ones who bring the money in. They're the ones who make it happen. So getting a business place in reverse place is hard. Getting an IT person replaced is easy. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of motivation there to, to make that partnership work. And um, I'll, I'll never forget when I first joined my organization, they were not agile. And I said, we're going to we're going to do this. They were on the backs of just finishing a massive project that didn't go well. They had to go on to the next phase of it. And they were told, uh, you know, it's going to be $40 million. And, and the CIO is going, I, I can't go to the board with $40 million. It'll, it'll be canceled. And uh, so me and, and the gentleman I work with, we said, we'll do it for 20, but we're going to do it agile. Now, we didn't know if we could do it for 20, but, but we also knew they didn't have a choice. So, hey, let's throw the cards down. And, and by picking such a high profile project, um, everybody had no option but to do everything they could to make it work. Uh, so what I, the first thing I did is I took my business partner and I said, hey, we're going to go to a, a, a Forrester event. And it's going to be a bunch of CIOs talking about Agile. And you're going to hear all the things that they hate about it. You're going to hear all the difficult things. They're going to complain about the business. And sure enough, they did not let me down. They just dumped all over it. Right? And, uh, and uh, you know, they were complaining about the business. That, and and the, the, the forest rep said, well, wait a minute. You got to understand. You got to work in partnership with them. They said, yeah, 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 yeah. And he goes, no, no, no. I want to understand what partnership looks like. And he goes, Angus Maryland, will you stand up, please? So he stood up. He goes, Angus brought his business partner here because he wanted her to hear every negative thing you had to say about Agile before she had to make the commitment to agree to go Agile. And then he looked at Marilyn, he goes, what are you going to do? And she goes, I'm in. Right? So it was like, uh, and, and, and her reason was real simple. If he's willing to show me this and make that, that does not help his case at all, what else is he going to make visible to me when, when, when mm. things start going really wrong? Um, I can trust this. I can trust this relationship. He's only known me for two weeks at that point. I was just going to come. Uh, but, but that difference attracted her of, I can trust this person. That's what you're going to get out of a value stream, is that deep trust relationship or a complete explosion. Uh, but guess what? Both are really visible and, and uh, uh, easy to detect which path they're on and the explosion can be fixed. Thank you for that, Angus. Um, yeah. What were some of the gotchas or the insights? Uh, this was a really good story, and it's a really good uh, uh, 
mechanism or a, a tool in your toolbox to actually uh, take that approach that you've taken. Um, but what, what gotchas did you get or uh, what trends did you notice in, in this journey? Um, I, I guess there's a few gotchas. The, the first thing that's going to happen is, let's, let's be honest, when we're selling the idea of value stream, we're selling an idea, we're selling a vision. And it doesn't take long before people realize that they have confused the sale with the delivery. Because what actually happens is different than the vision we, we pointed out. Look, when you're a value stream, you have all your own resources. You don't have the prioritization conflict with the rest of the company, except in all these little pieces we didn't tell you about. Well, those pieces are material and important. <laughs> so, so we didn't really solve that problem. So there's a lot of problems that still exist and we, we have a tendency to gloss over them. We need to make those visible and, and make sure they understand. Uh, so there's the first gotcha. Don't, don't, you're not selling a magic uh, uh, solution here. You're, you're not, it, you're selling hard work that's gonna get you to a better place, but mm. make sure they understand it's hard work. Uh, the, the other thing that really, this one surprised me uh, a little bit. We talk about, you know, how we break work down and, and into smaller pieces and, and, you know, all these things for the delivery of value. And I, I think we've all underestimated how important it is to do that well. Uh, and um, what I mean by that is we, we had a very large piece of work. It was about $60 million. We started breaking it down into, into pieces. And what happened is... Uh, People didn't break it down in the way that each piece was, we call it a deliverable capability. And they said, well, really to get the business capability I want, I need a little bit of this piece, a little bit of this piece, and a little bit of this piece. Well, as soon as you've done that, your oversight is, is really difficult. And knowing where are we in the process? Are we good? Have we, you know, for the money we've spent, have we delivered the value we expected? That becomes almost impossible to see if you don't do that, that breaking down properly. Uh, and um, I, I remember when, you know, we were starting this work and I said, we have not broken this down right. I think it's gonna cause us pain. Uh, I don't know where, I can't describe it. And I don't think it's gonna be one big pain. I think it's gonna be death by a thousand cuts. The yeah. problem is I can't describe them to you. And, and they said, well, there's no appetite to revisit this, so we have to go. And I agreed. I take full responsibility for going along with the crowd, but here we are going, we've spent X amount of money. We've spent, you know, 40 of the 60. And I don't know if we've delivered enough value for that 40 million or not. All I can tell you is how many points were delivered. All I can tell you is, is you know, kind of these very granular ideas, but how much value was delivered? I don't know if we're, you know, kind of, 10 million away from getting enough value or for 40 more million away, I can't tell you. And so that's probably one of the biggest things is um, you have to get that alignment of the value you're delivering in your value stream to the way you're gonna execute that work. They must be in alignment. Uh, uh, that's probably the biggest, biggest thing. Uh, and, and the problem is when you're dealing with such large, um, organizations you know, that can burn money really quickly. They're very good at burning money. Um, if you can't detect these problems early, you're gonna spend a lot of money and get very far down the road before you realize you have a serious problem. And then you're going to in sunk cost fallacy, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, we spent this much so far, we might as well, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. So, yeah. uh, it, it, it's it's amazing how um, how much how we structure the work impacts your ability to provide oversight, uh, and I think people really underestimate that. There is a weakness I find in MBA programs in that they do not teach assassination skills. Oh, sorry, I sorry, they do not teach which skills? Assassination skills. How okay. to how to kill initiatives? <laughs> okay, <laughs> like, okay, I'm missing it. Got it. Yeah, um, I, I I saw a, uh, uh, I used a video from um, uh, TED, one of the TED talks about the marshmallow um, tower, 
exercise. I don't know if you've ever seen that exercise. Um, I they have to build a, a tower out of a, a spaghetti and get a marshmallow supported at the top. And they said, one of the worst groups at is uh, recent graduates of MBA schools. They are the worst. Uh, and, and they said, because they spend all of their time, they've been trained to find the single best right answer. And they spend all of their time finding the single rest right best answer on paper. And then they try to execute. And at that point, they're so invested in the idea, they're so in love with the idea that they can't imagine a fascinating it. We can't kill it. This is our child. You know, and, and so we have to nurture it and grow it. And, and but that's the way they're trained. Uh, that's the way they're taught in school. This this idea um, that will, you know, will will try a bit and build on that, build on it, build it is it's so foreign to them that they, they can't even imagine that it could work. Um, just out of interest, any guesses on um, who the best, uh, some of the best were, excluding engineers, because they have this unfair advantage of understanding structures, triangles, those kinds of things. But any idea who was the best? It was recent, imagine, recent graduates. It was recent I would, graduates. Yeah, I would imagine some kids, basically. Yeah, recent they, they, graduates of, of kindergarten were the best. That's right. Because <laughs> they just play. <laughs> that's it. So they just start throwing stuff up and going, well, that didn't work, that didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Exactly uh, so. Now, yeah. um, you were mentioning earlier the challenge of um, how much value have we actually achieved. <clears throat> and I've noticed, uh, I've, I've just attended recently the um, Agile 2022 conference in, in Nashville. And one of the right. things that, that really struck me at that conference is everybody says value, but they mean something radically different. Mm. Yeah, and we yeah. think we understand what you're talking about, but we're not, because everybody has their own mental model as to what value is. Some people say the word value, and you hear in their voice the clinking of coins. Yes. It's money, it's money, it's money. You hear other people talk about value, and you hear in their voice the anguish of better environment, better food, better connection, better relationship, better service. This has got very little to do with money as such. Yeah, you need money as a... Uh, as a supportive mechanism, but it's not the whole thing. So understanding a better grasp of what value actually is, that is hard. That is tricky. <clears throat> and that's what inspired me to write a book on it, but it'll, it'll still be a few months until uh, that gets out. It's still really, really tough. Well, I'm going to be very interested to see, to see what you wrote on that, because that is a very, very challenging uh, a subject, and I, I will not pretend to be an expert in it, uh, but all I can share with you is, is you know, the, the few observations I've made. And the first thing is you say, well, what is value? Um, my, my answer is, I don't know. Let me go ask the person who I'm doing the work for, because they're the only ones who can define value for me. Um, it doesn't matter what I think it is. Uh, it, it's not my product. It's theirs. So what's of value to you? Uh, that's where I start. The, the other thing I find is a lot of people work very hard to quantify it. You know, can I put some kind of scale? Um, you know, I, I know in um, uh, uh, the, the scaled agile framework, they said, hey, you can go out there and I can say, well, Horia, as, as my, um, uh, you know, business stakeholder, here are the five things I'm going to do for you. Can you give them a relative value? And, and that's interesting, but, it, but it's, it's still a very fabricated um, a measurement. And at the end of the day, it ends up in, in a um, semantic argument more than, than anything, because I'll say, how did I do on this? And you go, well, you didn't hit the mark. You didn't get it into production. So I'm only going to give you, you know, 60% of the value. And I said, well, wait a minute, I got it to here and that's our deal. With it. And so they were in a semantic argument. Well, you should have worded that differently. That's a pointless exercise. And so when I work with my value stream, especially my, my, my newest one, I'll say, you know what, let's, let's use a really crude measurement for value. Here's a piece of work. You've broken it down into the, these 10 capabilities. And what I'm going to do is, is I, I am going to say out of the 100%, how much of the 100% do you attribute to this capability, that capability will go, will go down through it. And I say, great. If you have called this first one 20%, when I have delivered that to your satisfaction, I have now delivered 20% of the value. Hopefully, I only spent 20% of the money. If I've spent 50% of the money, we have a problem. 
because you're not going to get the rest of the value. Um, the, the other thing, and this is where teams really, uh, and value streams do a lot to undercut themselves. Uh, they'll say, here's the, the 10 capabilities I want. And, uh, and, and I'll say, great. What, what one brings you the most value? And they'll go, this one. I get, oh, great, let's do that first. They go, well, no, 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 we have this low-hanging fruit over here. Um, as soon as someone says low-hanging fruit, I'm going, that's the kiss of death. Because I, I can go in and I can do it and, and release it and I can do it perfectly. I can do it under budget. And everybody in the business goes, yeah, who cares? It mm -hmm. wasn't that interesting to them. Uh, so yeah, I delivered something of incredibly marginal value to you and you don't care. Meanwhile, I do that one big thing and it might be complicated and scary and ugly and I'm not even sure if we can do it. But when it's done, the business goes, wow, this is when, what we've been waiting for. You can forget the rest of those things. We got this. And it's amazing how much work they'll forgo to get that one big thing they value. Uh, so question is how do you scale monetize that uh i i'm not i haven't found a way yet so if your book yeah. has a way again i'll uh... <laughs> well see <laughs> that's the thing i'm going to call it the language of value because yeah. i'm not calling it the solution to value or the definition of value <laughs> i'm not claiming that because i don't yeah. think <clears throat> that such a thing is possible as a recipe um th that's if you will one of the insights uh in yeah. writing the book is it's not like physics, where in physics, you yeah. come up with a formula and you say E equals MC squared. There you go, baby. That's energy. Plug in the, ma the mass, plug in the um, speed of light, and you're good. You got your, yeah. your result. It doesn't work that way with value because value is a social construct. What is yeah. a value today may not be a value tomorrow. And one interesting book that I'm going to do in this, um, in this book is I'm going to take words and I'm going to use the etymology of the word. I'm going to show, here's the history of how we ended up with this word. Here's what it actually meant. Because for instance, <clears throat> one of the, <clears throat> the roots of the word value itself uh, has to do with strength. It comes from Latin valere. Um, um, a related word is valet, for instance. Mm -hmm. It's that assistant that's strong, that is helpful to um, the, the leader of the house, right? That's the valet. So... Yeah. Value is that which gives you strength, that which gives you ability. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I, I, uh, I'll never forget, I got my first real lesson in, in value a long time ago. I went to buy a Jeep Wrangler and I went into the dealership and they had this beautiful Wrangler on, on the floor. And I said, I like this. Oh, it doesn't have air conditioning. No, nah, I don't want this one. And he goes, what do you need air conditioning for? You're going to be, it, it's summer. You're going to have the roof down. You know, what do you need air conditioning for? His logic was impeccable. But I looked at him and said, it's my Jeep. If I want air conditioning, I'm going to have air conditioning. And if I want to drive down the, the road with the roof off and the air conditioning blowing all over me, then that is my choice. And you can't tell me it's wrong. And, and he, the, the poor guy, I, I kind of felt bad for him at that point because he's like, uh, he didn't know what to say that. But, and oddly enough, you would be surprised how many times I would drive down the road with the roof down and the air conditioning blowing on my face because the sun's hot. And so getting cold air moving over me was great. I'm glad I didn't listen to him. I <laughs> knew what I valued and I stuck it out to get what I valued. That's uh, right. So, and that was a real eye opener for me. Totally, totally uh, serendipitous experience. <laughs> value is in the eye of the beholder. So, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, or on a Friday night, is value is in the eye of the beer holder. But let's move <laughs> That's on. That's it. <laughs> um, your your uh, your journeys or your experiences in uh, with value streams and and getting that embedded, etc. Um, in what ways have you seen governance uh, adapting to this new focus on value streams in this new area? Um, I, I've seen governance really struggle with, with how to adapt to it. Um, and, and one of the, and, and you guys are very well, well aware of this. One of the challenges we have in, in any kind of governance or oversight is this idea that the more precision we have, the better the oversight. And, and I'm going, well, actually that's, that's probably not true. 
because what happens is we all often end up with um, you know fictitious details details mm -hmm. based on assumptions details based on what we think may or may not happen and and at the end of the day those are guesses but we base a lot of governance and a lot of control on these guesses and, and you know a special is I, I have a military background let's say look no plan survives first contact with the enemy so you put together this this great um approach and this plan and and all these details and as soon as i try to execute it it starts falling apart is your governance ready to react to that is your governance ready to deal with the fact that things are going to change so don't give me a um you know if i've got things that are changing every two three weeks don't give me a governance process that requires four weeks to absorb those changes mm -hmm. so i'm going to be forever behind uh and and so uh, I, I, the big message I'm always giving people is your governance and your oversight must be structured uh, to the level of real information you have available to you. So if you only have high level information, your governance must be set at that same high level with the understanding that you've got wide margins of error. And as you start to narrow in, your governance can narrow in. But it mm -hmm. must be doing it at the same rate as the details that are supportable and real and it must be doing it um, commensurate to the value it brings. So please don't put in a, a, a huge oversight or governance function that brings incremental value to, to the uh, organization uh, because now you're just creating a huge administrative drag on, on the company. Uh, and and I, I love it. Someone, <laughs> I don't know why they set me up like this because they know I'll say things like this. Someone said, you know, I want these people to start changing the way they're doing um, this work here um, because it'll really simplify our, our reporting. And, and I said, let me, let me see if I understand what you're telling me. You want me to ask 250 people to change the way they work so that your reporting gets easier. And, and they kind of looked at me and said, well, it sounds kind of stupid when you say it that way. And I said, hmm. Your statement made and answered. So, anyways, moving mm -hmm. on. Like, and and so we, we we but we get this comfort out of this detail, whether it's real or not. We look and go, look, there's a lot of details here. They must know. But most of it was fabricated, and yeah. and we won't figure out how fabricated until we actually get into it and go, oh, was that ever wrong? <laughs> and it's it's not only fabricated. When we when we talk to Scott Ambler, it's also gamed. It's also. Fight. Oh, of course it is. <laughs> I, I, I will point out over and over again, I said, hey, look, we're dealing with IT people and they have two amazing skill sets. They can solve complex problems and they can play games. And <laughs> if you, if you uh, don't set this up properly, they will use their complex problem solving skills to game that system. Uh, and, and, uh, and it's all about making you know, the management, the oversight, the governance, everything to go away and leave them alone. And they will give you whatever answer makes you go away. Whether it's right or not is a secondary consideration. It just needs to be right enough. And, and, and that's, that's a, a deadly combination. Yeah, God, God certainly had a lot of experience in that space. <laughs> so we've come across two patterns that deals exactly with, with this specific phenomenon. The, the first pattern is, is to... Um, and this is borrowed from uh, corporate rebels, uh, yeah. some of their case studies, is to make everybody directly accountable to a customer, um, including yeah. your your oversight uh, people. And then, so so that that's one potential thing to do. Um, and now the second one. <laughs> oh God, I know about the second one. Um, okay. So make make that's a trick is is to actually oh and the second one is embed those uh, uh, people into the actual teams get them as close as possible even yeah. if there's just a proximity of them sitting closer to the team where they can overhear what's going on that's yeah. a, that that's immediately taking away a probably half at least half of the faff and the, the vanity matrix and the unnecessary uh, jumping through hoops just yeah. by proximity. Yeah, those are very, very valuable uh, uh, actions to take. And they certainly pay dividends correctly, especially that, that proximity one. 
Um, it builds that understanding of, you know, uh, all those asking this, but it's not because he's being difficult. It's because he has a problem and, and this will solve that problem. That's why he's asking. Uh, what I do find interesting about the accountable to the customer one, and this is a bit where IT arrogance can step in again. Um, I, I, I have a, a challenge I'm facing right now where a business stakeholder is going, hey, I, I don't like the solution being produced here. It's, it's got gaps in it. And so, guys, we're going to go back. We're going to rethink um, how we're proving the solution, how we're demonstrating it, all these things to highlight these gaps more. And there's a lot of, of, of you know, we'll call it rework. It's not necessarily recoding or anything like that, but it's going back and looking at what's been done again to say, did we capture all the right business scenarios? Uh, and, and we can get into how it was missed and there, there, there was a whole... Um, look at how that was missed and, and, and some very good reasons for it. But what was interesting is the IT people were pushing back and saying, no, no, we're not going to do that. We don't need to do that. That's ridiculous. It's a waste of time and money. Da, da, da. And, and they ranted on about this for about 10 minutes. And I said, I'm sorry, this is the customer. If the customer is willing to pay and willing to take the delay in schedule to get this done so that they feel comfortable that we're going to support their business, who are we to tell them no? And and that was a real aha moment for a lot of people. It was like, if they're willing to pay, what's your problem? Why are you saying no? Mm. Is it because you don't want to do it? Or if you, if you don't want to do it, that's fine. You should have done the right things the first time. So we didn't need the business person in this space. But here we are. Now we have to earn our way out of this hole. And uh, now as good partners, we'll talk to the business person about, you know, some of the, the things we, that might be more effective. But if she says no, the answer is no. And you must respect that no. Uh, so very, very interesting. Even the customer can be a, a, a real challenge because people will fight back against that customer if they don't like what they're saying. Get over it. They're paying the bill. <laughs> well, <clears throat> that's part of the difficulty of value, because as a customer, we have this idea that the customer is always right. <clears throat> yeah, and that would be wonderful if we knew how to practice magic. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because if we knew how to do magic, then whatever the customer says, we go abracadabra and. Yeah. Um, we get the result that the customer wanted. However, we don't know how to practice magic. We can only do certain things. Certain things are viable with our current understanding of technology, our current capabilities. And therefore, there is always a negotiation between That's what right. I'm hoping is easy because the intuition of the layperson as to what technology can and can't do is sometimes really weird, really strange. Well, that should be easy. And you talk to a technical person and the technical person goes, no, 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 no. That's so hard. We don't know how to do that. It can't be done. <clears throat> yeah. And vice versa, because the customer says, no, I'm not going to ask for that. That's too hard. And the technologist goes, come on, man, that's too easy. See, boom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, and you're right. You need that conversation to happen, and that's again that partnership. Uh, Aldo, what's your, what, what problem are you trying to solve? And you talk to me about the problem, and I, and, and I might say, you know what, I, I don't know if I can solve that one, but I can get you close with this one. Let's mm. talk about what that might look like. And uh, and and by the way, I can do some things over here that might prove I can solve your problem, or might prove I can't. Maybe we should spend some time investing there. And you want to have that conversation uh, mm -hmm. constantly. Uh, I, I, what I find interesting is we, we want to default to this world where I don't have to have the conversation because I can all go to write down exactly what he wants. He gave me a specification. We're good. And then we implement it, and all of goes, what the heck is this? Well, it beats exactly what you put in the document. I guess in theory, but it's still useless. Uh, and, and so we got to get past that. Um, it, it, we all say we know we got to communicate. and, and it, Yeah, but that also means communicating with the people who I, I don't particularly like communicating with, but they're key to solving the problem. So mm -hmm. guess what? I'm going to communicate with them. 
uh, what I like has very little relevance to do with that situation because I need to get the, the better outcome. So back to that 85% of psychology of the people. <laughs> Yeah, well, you're talking about specifications. The challenge with anything written down is that uh, we often forget that there's something called a craft factor. Yeah. So the, the craft factor has to do with uh, how do I know that absolutely everything that I've written down is absolutely correct, that I've made no mistake whatsoever, right? It's like, even with the best of intentions, I may make a typo. I may um, have the grammar a little bit wonky. I, I, I saw a great example of that in my first first job. I, I was in a defense contractor and I was working with military specifications and contracts. You want to talk about precise documents. Oh my gosh, they have mill standards on how to write. Mill standards. They, you know, and, and uh, I'll never forget we 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 made this um uh, radio with a, a carrying case. And in the carrying case there was a, a pocket where you could put uh, the handset the antenna uh, and uh, one other piece of equipment, I can't remember. Uh, and it would fit in that pocket and we, we demonstrated it to the military and they said, no, 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 where's the battery go? And we go, well, what do you mean, where's that on the radio? And they go, no, no, the spare battery, that's not a requirement. And they said, of course it is. And they, they, they pulled up the, the, the document, they said, look, it will also have a pouch for uh, including auxiliary devices, um, uh, i.e. Um, handset, um, antenna uh, and, and uh, earpiece right? and they said so there it is for example and we said no 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 that is IE that is that list is definitive and and it was like such a simple little mistake that people make all the time uh, I see people use IE when they mean EG EG when they mean IE um, and because someone misinterpreted that uh, they, they said well we need the battery well that was a change control back into the contract cost them about 35 million dollars because someone put ie instead of eg well doesn't that just speak to the problem with specifications i was lucky that was that was about month two of my career that i saw that one mm. <laughs> it would have probably just cost 10 dollars to just uh have the conversation up front that's right but show them a bag and they we, we made one out of out of raw cotton and they, they yeah. look at me go where do you put the battery oh okay well, <laughs> yeah we were we were into beta testing by the time they picked that one up and, and that means you know tons of radios and tons of of, of very expensive canvas uh, <clears throat> bags were made and all kinds of stuff so, yeah, yeah that was that was a real eye-opener so Oh, how are we reading uh, the, the documents? I'm too busy to read the detail, right? How are we understanding it? Well, my understanding wasn't precise enough. And even if I do understand it, am I actually following what's written there? Mm. Do I trust um, that it's actually right? Or do I go, no, 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 you don't understand. You can't do it that way. It has to be done this way. So <laughs> there's so much trouble. I, I, I remember I published something I called the hierarchy of communications. And, and I said, our goal when we communicate is always to move to the highest fidelity form of communication possible. So at the top, face to face. And then the you know, next layer down is, um, you know, video conference and then maybe phone call, text, you know, mm. down and down. There. And sitting there at the bottom is documentation. And I'm going, why do we always default to the lowest fidelity conversation for the most important parts of our work? Why aren't we going to the top and saying face to face? Uh, and, and and how do we measure people's? It's, it's the same thinking. Is how do we measure people's productivity? Oh, you've worked sixty hours this week. You're super productive. It's <laughs> like, <laughs> what did you do in that sixty hours? It's it's same thinking. Yeah, well, I could say, yeah, you're super productive, or you're really bad at estimating, and I can't tell you which. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting challenge for sure. Cool. Um, what, uh, in your opinion, do you think can um, initiatives or value streams and oversight functions do to find harmony in getting better value? Wow. Uh, what do they do to find harmony in getting value? Uh, I think really it, it, that's 
that's a problem I'm trying to figure out how to solve right now. Uh, because you've got, I've got, you know, my value stream leadership so entrenched in their way of thinking that to, to say, look, that thinking's not aligned and it's creating challenges. Even getting them to see that is, is, the, is the first problem. If I can get them past that, and, it, and it's very interesting, I, I, I get these groups of people, so I'll, I'll say, here's our, our agilists and here's our, our oversight group, and we need to um, find a way to create that harmony so that we can get the, the uh, information you need uh, in, in the right form so that you can understand what's happening. Answering that basic question, you know, are we good? Are we good or are we not good? Are, are we going in a good direction? Are we going in a bad direction? Just getting that sorted out. It's interesting. I said the first thing we have to do is put them together and let them spend some amount of time. It could be a couple of hours. It could be a couple of months blaming each other because that's where they're going to go first. And we're going to have to let them just keep blaming each other until they're tired and exhausted. And we say, okay, now that that's done, how do we solve this problem? And, and then you got to get people starting to look at it and say, hey, um, you know, uh, although tell me again what you're really trying to get line of sight on. And you're going, I, I just need to know if we're going to be ready for this trade show. Right. Okay. I can show you this and, and you're going, yeah, that doesn't quite do it. I need to understand. And then we start working through it. And guess what? There's a solution there. And when they start finding those solutions, that harmony starts to actually manifest and starts to become a, 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 a rolling ball, you know, the momentum is up and up and up. But it all starts with that getting past the it's your fault and starting to say something as simple as, well, Although I'm not going to get them fired. So I guess I have to figure out what I'm going to do to make it easier to work with Aldo. And as soon as I hit that moment uh, and I present myself to you that way, guess what you did? You present yourself back the same way. Maybe mm -hmm. not instantly because now you're suspicious of me. And so you're going to circle me a few times and go, what's, what's his game? What's he doing? But then you just go, no, wait a minute. He's, he's genuine about this. And then you start working with me and we start to build that, that relationship that's going to allow us to get that harmony. What does it look like specifically? I, I, I don't know. It, it, you'll have to show me the pair of people first and you'll have to show me the problem they're trying to solve. And then we can look at that and say, what's the right solution here? And, and I think, Aria, you, you referenced it earlier. You said, it's not one solution in every organization. I have to look at the specific nature of this organization. It's culture, it's, it's um, uh, the individuals that are engaged, the nature of the work they're doing, all of that is going to affect that harmony. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm working with one organization uh, right now and, um, you know, had to get people to the realization, everybody's going, you know, well, wait a minute, this is going to cost too much, this is going to, you know, we're going to overrun budget and, and aren't you worried about it? No, the company doesn't worry about budget. They don't care about budget. They only care about time. Get it done by the date that we need it. Don't care what it costs. So guess what? All kinds of oversight around cost, while interesting, is not particularly useful to them. And so I, I said, let's put in the bare minimum of cost oversight so we know that it's not running rampant and someone's suddenly going to have to explain, you know, where did, where did that $5 million go? <laughs> what $5 million? You know, let's get that sorted out with the bare minimum. But what we're really going to do is put the, the oversight on, hey, are, are we going to hit the trade show? Are we going to have enough value that we'll be able to stand up at a trade show and show someone what we've done here? Mm. That's what they, they um, were focused on. And so their oversight needed to have that lens on it. Uh, again, government organization, money is a very distant second concern. Staying off the front page of the newspapers is number one above everything else. Uh, and so every, every oversight function they have is about keeping them off the front page of the newspaper. And being late puts you on the front page. Spending $10 million extra does not. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, uh, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> Here's something that uh, is tricky. In 
many parts of the world, we have more and more polarization. We identify more intensely with, I'm with this community. Oh no, I'm with that community. And as soon as you say something, the way you've said it or the way you, you kind of pronounce yourself on a particular topic, oh, you must be with them. You're not with us, you're yeah. an enemy uh, of ours. So this intense polarization, I'm concerned that it's very toxic uh, for humans in general and societies in, in particular, and then smaller communities specifically. Because you just described that in order to achieve value flow and harmony, we need conversation, we need dialogue. We need to trust yeah. one another. In other words, we need to figure out ways of going beyond polarization and sit down, share a meal, have a conversation, understand each other's perspective, understand the humanity in the other person. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Where do you even go with that? That that is such uh <laughs> yeah. While we're while we're dealing with that, we might as well tackle world hunger and world peace. Uh because <laughs> you're kind of in that scale of problem now. Uh you're basically saying, how do I look at the two of you and and not form any bias uh based on on you know what I see here? Uh, and that's hard because whether I like it or not, I have a bias um, and and it's unconscious. So a lot of times I don't even know uh, mm. it, 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 it's affecting me. And I, um, you know, I surround myself with people who will check me on my bias. So um, when I make, you know, when I go down a path or, or, or looking at something, that seems odd to them, they'll, they'll, they'll question me pretty hard. Well, what, I, what are, you, are you sure? And they'll eventually reach that point. Are you sure you're not just biased against this? It's like, huh, yeah, you might be right. It, it's very hard. Um, and and you, unfortunately, you're hitting on probably one of the biggest, uh, and I, you know, it might be a little heresy to say this, but one of the biggest weaknesses in Agile is it relies on us shedding those biases. And if you can't, the system becomes incredibly delicate and incredibly fragile. And that's a problem. Uh, and you can, there's no agile framework in the world. There's no rules. There's no um, um, processes or procedures that's going to overcome that fragility caused by bias. Uh, and so it really comes down to, uh, uh, and I've asked this question before, um, the culture of that you're creating in your team and in your organization, uh, if I have a star performer who does not work well with others, do I keep them in the organization? And vast majority are going to say absolutely. And, and my answer is no, I'm going to encourage him to, to apply his skills in another organization. Because the detriment, uh, uh, detrimental effect to the team far outweighs the benefit he can bring as an individual, no matter how good they are. And that is an incredibly tough decision to make. Uh, I have made that decision in the past and have been heavily scrutinized for it. Mm. Uh, and I'm okay, I'm okay with that. Um, you know, uh, or or you know, my favorite is. We'll just put that person on special projects over here all by themselves. You know, let's put, put some walls around them, give them an office. <laughs> that way we can minimize the collateral damage. You know? <laughs> and then so, but yeah, sometimes you have to sideline uh, someone if they're going to fight and argue against uh, that, uh, um, that, that culture you're trying to build. Uh, and, and it was uh, interesting. I, I you know, I have these teams that reported to me, and I, I asked a group of people that I was coaching, I said, how often do you think that team talks to me about operational things? So what are they doing, the state of their work, uh, those kinds of things. And I, I said, take a guess, you know, how many times a, you know, a week, a month, whatever. And, and they said, oh, I don't know, four or five times a week. And, and I said, no, 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 maybe once or twice a month. And, and what they're bringing to me is, we're dealing with this challenge. It's feeling risky. Can you help us work through it? Absolutely. And that's an operational concern. 
But then I said, how many times do you think I engage them in a, uh, in a month um, in, in a non-operational way? And, and they said, oh, I don't know, four or five times. I said, no, at least two to three times a week. And in those engagements, that's where I'm going to talk to them about the state of the team. And so how are you guys operating as a team? Are you, are you functionally uh, well? Or are you challenging each other? Um, are you creating problems for yourself? What can we do to work through them? And I'm going to set that mode uh, and that expectation that we're going to talk through these things. And yeah, I've had to stop conversations. I, I'll never forget um, one, one QA was kind of at the end of a rope. And, and she'd been having problems that kept repeating over and over and over again. And, and the team just wasn't helping her solve those problems. And she lost it. She went off her nut and she said, I wouldn't have to deal with these, this problem if the developers weren't so freaking lazy about doing their job properly. And I was just like, well, okay, meeting stopped. Hold on a second. And, and I, I looked at the QA and I said, you didn't really mean that they're lazy, did you? She goes, no, I didn't. <laughs> and she looked at the developer she goes, I'm very sorry for saying that. I'm just frustrated. Mm. And, and I said, developer, did you have any idea you were driving her to this point of frustration? They're like, no. Great. Now let's work through that. Mm. Uh, and, and you're going to have to, as the leader, you're going to have to model that behavior constantly. And it means I put myself in the middle of some very, very, very uncomfortable conversations. And, and, um, it, that's hard for me. It, at heart, I am a true IT person. I am 100% introverted. So when you see me acting in an extroverted way, that is a learned behavior because I mm. knew I wouldn't succeed as an introvert. I had to learn to be extroverted. And that means I have to apply those skills in, in the job and set myself in the middle of conversations that I am desperately trying to run away from. But I know I have to be there. And I don't know a better way to get around it than that. Um, and, and, and I have to accept the fact that I don't care if my peers are doing this and I don't care if my boss is doing it, I will do it. And, yes. and um, if they don't want to do it, that is their choice and their right. Uh, but they will get the, the, the results to come from that choice as yes. I will get the results to come from my choice. And at least in my sphere of influence, I can create a very trusting environment where people will uh, engage me very openly and, and will overcome those, those uh, you know, biases and those silos that you, you talked about. Too. But it, it, it takes time, uh, like a lot of time. I, I invest years in these teams, not, not days and not weeks. So. Yeah, um, building bridges or a messy business, sometimes you have to deal with the mud, yeah? So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, Angus, it's Sar been a... sarcasm helps, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought it was the Prozac, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Angus, it was really good uh, to to have you on on our uh, podcast today. Um, I've learned I've learned something. I really like this two in a box. It it means yes. so much. Um, it's so such a a quick a quick uh, phrase to remember, but um, I really like that, that phrase. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. It no problem. Works. Yeah. So um, thank you very much, Angus. And um, yeah, thank you for your time. Um, that's the thank end you. of our episode today. I'm Aldu. And I'm Horia, and we thank Angus very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>